Welcome, Rabbi Rami Shapiro. It's really good to see you again. It's been a long time, Mark, but thank you for having me. Great to see you. I'd like to ask you about the Sabbath uh, and the universal importance of keeping a Sabbath of some kind. Can you give me some sense of why Sabbath matters? Sure. I can give you my sense of why Sabbath matters. Um, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, obviously. But, you know, if you go back to the, the, the Jewish text, so I'm going to assume, even though Sabbath is universal, focus on the one I know, which is, you know, the, from the Jewish point of view, and, and take a look at the Torah when it talks about Shabbat. Uh, it says, you know, remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. And then it says six days you'll work and accomplish all of your goals. On, but on the seventh day, it's a Shabbat. Le, I mean, if you were reading it in a conventional sense, you'd say Shabbat la Adonai, which means a Sabbath to the Lord. But that misses the point because the actual Hebrew text is unpronounceable. And in Adonai, Lord is a substitute word. If the actual name of God in the text is the YHVH or the yud heh vav -Hey, that most English Bibles translate as Lord, but that misses the whole point. Lord is a noun, Lord is masculine, Lord is hierarchical. yud heh vav -Hey is a verb, and it's non-hierarchical. It comes from the Hebrew word for uh, being or, or uh, happening, not the noun of being, but you know, the action, the process of being itself. So one day a week, the Bible says, you're supposed to set aside, you know, you work for six days, you try to bend the world to your will for six days. And then on the seventh day, you dedicate the day to being rather than having. You know, Eric Fromm makes that distinction between having and being. So having is when you're grasping, you're clinging, you're asserting your will. And being is when you're, I mean, I think the Chinese have the best uh, languaging for it. It's you know what they call wei wu wei, non-coercive action. It's a very Taoist day in a sense, because you're, you're going with the flow of nature. You're acting in harmony with the moment and not trying to impose your will on the moment. If that's what we're talking about, then it's crucial for two reasons, at least. One is imposing your will on the world is personally exhausting and planetarily probably <laughs> destructive, right? I mean, that's what, what's my will, meaning not Rami, but meaning what's the human will? Well, the human will is to dominate. The human will is to, to extract, uh, you know, exploit resources, exploit other human beings, exploit animals. And that's, that's what you do for six days. The Bible doesn't say stop doing it all together. You probably couldn't get away with that. But at least one day a week, see if you can find your true self, see if you can find your truer nature and let all of that go, which is why the, the, the text is explicit about saying this is not a personal Sabbath only. This is, you know, your, your, uh, your spouse uh, has the Sabbath, the kids have a Sabbath, your servants, and they're talking about, you know, first paid servants or your indentured servants, but then even your slaves as male slaves, female slaves, they all have a Sabbath. And then it says animals have a Sabbath. So this is an interspecies day of non-coercive engagement with the world. And that I think that's why it says in the beginning, we're talking about Exodus 20, 10, why in the beginning it says, remember the Sabbath day, because it's so hard to remember that I'm not in charge, that the world isn't here for me to bend to my will. I have to remember that all the time. And then I have to remember it's not just for me. So the importance of a Sabbath is to put you back in your, I mean, you could call it Buddha mind, your Buddha nature back in, in the, you know, I'm just mixing traditions here, Christ consciousness, the, your, your original uh, truest self as a manifesting of the divine, which would reveal to you that everything is a manifesting of the divine. That's what the yud heh vav heh YHVH means in Hebrew. And then taking a day and living as if that were true. And then hopefully it becomes true 
And then ideally, and then I'll stop, it becomes true enough to bleed into Sunday and maybe Monday. Mm, mm. In, in the Jewish tradition, you can actually stretch the Shabbat out from Friday night to Wednesday. And so what they're saying is uh, maybe this consciousness will change the way you actually live during the week, but not the whole week. So you have a couple of days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday until sundown, you can be your old self. But then, oh yeah, I remember that's not really who I am. So it's crucial to, uh, for that I, alone is to remember who I am, but not to turn it into a privatized thing so that it does ex in fact extend. I mean, it's really planetary. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense. It makes complete sense. So I'm interested in how Sabbath and Sabbath observance changes our relationship to time. You know, I see it as a, time, a way of dropping out of ordinary time, out of nunc fluens into the eternal present. Could you talk a little bit about how we should relate to time around Sabbath and how it shifts our relationship to time? Yeah, I think I, I know that uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, famous rabbi, wrote a book on Sabbath and he called it a cathedral in time. Uh, or maybe a cathedral of time might be more accurate. My own sense of, of time during the Sabbath is the Sabbath is in a sense timeless. You're out of time. <laughs> I mean, not at the, like at the end of your life, you're out of time, but you know, you, you just step out of time because time is, I mean, the flow of the seasons, the, the circling of the uh, the planet and, and uh, just on its axis to give you a day and then around the, the sun to give you a year. All of that is ongoing. That's time. But the way what we've done with time is we've chopped it up into these little bits. Then we staple it on our wrist, you know, with a, a, a digital watch or, a, you know, a smart watch. And it's just clicking away nanoseconds. And you're going, oh, my God, I haven't done this. I haven't done this. I haven't done it. We're constantly looking at our time. That's not healthy. And that's, that's human time. That's not normal time. That's not time determined by the relationship to the planet and, uh, and the sun. That's just the, a human invention. And then we've refined it with all the efficiencies so that we can get more done in less time, which doesn't really work, but that's, you know, that's what we say. And on the Sabbath, you just, you don't wear a watch. You don't have to be anywhere. I mean, even if you're, you know, you, you go to a synagogue or something like that, which I do not do, we could get into that if you want, but I find that too much, too much coercive behavior on my part. Uh, but you're stepping out of time and there's, there's no time. So there's all the time in the world. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you just don't have to deal with, with the, the, the time imagined by the economy or the capitalist system, that kind of thing. That's what makes the Sabbath so revolutionary. You're, you're, if it was done the way I think it should be done, it's a personal and communal break with the entire economic system. You, you just step out of it. And if you can step out of it, then you realize you've stepped into it. It's a conscious act. So you could step out whenever you want. Once you mm -hmm. have the habit of, once you know, you've got that muscle to, that, that will free you from it. You can make the effort to stop making effort. It's mm -hmm. paradoxical. Is that so? mm -hmm. And that's an anti-capitalist idea, isn't it? it I think direct, it is. Directly counter to everything that we're taught about productivity and staying busy and uh, just do it, you know, that, that American mantra. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and the way the Sabbath is often misused in contemporary society, you know, uh, it's the same way mindfulness, or, you know, is being misused in my, or, and yoga for that matter, in my estimation. It's, it's being made subservient to the economic machine. Oh, you got to take a day off just to recharge your batteries, like you were a machine, right? Just to recharge your batteries so you can get back in there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. just healthy. It's mentally healthy. It's physically healthy. One, one day a week of rest is not enough to actually make you physically healthy. I mean, we don't sleep enough. We, there's all kinds of things going on with, with us in the United States anyway, but Western industrial society and those societies that are trying to become you know, industrial societies or post-industrial societies. 
one day a, a week taking a break is not enough, but it's a start. So, you know, I'm not, I don't want to discount it entirely, but when it's used to make you more productive during the six days, that makes no sense. That's like, you know, there's this book on mindfulness. I, I, I don't know what the title is, but the, the um, subtitle is uh, how to become, how to have less stress, how to be less stressful, more productive and enjoy life as if that's what the Buddha had in mind. <laughs> right. You know, you can see him talking to the Sangha, the community going, hey, guys, don't stress out so much. <laughs> Let's meditate, be cool. And then we can get more work done later in the day. I mean, right, it's, just, right, right. it's ridiculous. But that's what capitalism does. That's why you have yoga in the workplace. That's why you have mindfulness in the workplace in order to make the workplace less deadly so that you can devote more energy to being a cog in that, in that wheel. I mean, everyone's got to eat and the way you eat you know, in the Western capitalist societies, you have to earn a living. So I get that. Um, but on Shabbat, you don't earn a living. The living is free. You know, it's, it's, you realize that, that uh, life is a given. It doesn't have to be earned. Um, and no one has to earn it on your behalf. So all your employees are supposed to take a break. I mean, just imagine what would happen if the country and everything is inter, um, you know, it's global. So if the whole globe took a break every day from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, if everything is shut down and said, Hey, let's just relax, <laughs> you know, not, we're not going to, we're not going to produce anything for 24 hours. I mean that, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it would be an interesting experiment. It would. And we've had a bit of an imposed Sabbath through the pandemic, you know, when people were forced to stop, were forced to shut down, so to speak. And we saw how the environment benefited, how the po fish population yeah. started regenerating, you know, air pollution started to get better. So what are the spiritual opportunities through in this moment of pandemic and global, you know, global uncertainty? Yeah. Well, I think that the spiritual opportunity is to finally recognize that uncertainty is the norm. Uncertainty is, you know, in the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the opening line of Genesis uh, says, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim et ha uh, You know, in the beginning when God creates the, the earth and the sky or heavens and the earth, it says the earth was tohu vavohu, which means wild and unformed. It's chaos. And unlike other creation stories where the God kills chaos, the dragon or whatever, and builds an ordered world out of chaos, God just says, let's light it up. <laughs> it's, it's mad. It's wild. It's chaos. Let's have a look at it. So let there be light. But God never gets rid of the chaos, uh, never gets rid of the uncertainty, never gets rid of the insecurity. Now, to me, it's a parable. I don't take this literally that it actually happened that way. I think someone came up with this poetic articulation of a, a deep truth, which is life is fluid, impermanent, uncontrollable, uh, without any real security. And COVID showed you that. I mean, people who, you know, you thought who were healthy suddenly get COVID and die, 600 plus thousand of them. Uh, now, COVID just showed us that in more stark terms. But if you're conscious of what goes on around the planet before COVID, that happens, that was happening anyway, because that's the nature of, of reality. We put a veneer of order over things and then we're surprised when the chaos breaks through. But that's, it's a faux surprise. I mean, it's just, you're surprised because you're stupid because <laughs> the chaos is always breaking through because the chaos is all you got. Mm. So I think the spiritual lesson is to stop, uh, I don't know, I was going to say stop playing God, stop trying to control the universe, stop mm. trying to make things bend to your will, like I said with Shabbat, and realize it doesn't work that way, that life is wild and you either learn to surf the wildness or you drown. Uh, and eventually everybody drowns, I guess, but um, there is no going to make this safe. I mean, even the vaccines, I, mean, I got my vaccine. 
I'm fully vaccinated. And I thought, okay, now I'm safe. But that's not true. I mean, there's all the other things that could kill me, like, you know, getting hit by a car. But uh, now we know, oh, no, there's breakthrough infections. You can still get COVID. And now there's a, we've got Delta, but now they're worried about Lambda and then whatever comes after that. And, you know, you know, the, the, I, I mean, my general sense is, is that nature is, is, you know, grabbing us by the lapels and saying, listen, boys and girls, the world isn't the way you think. Wake up. You know, I am not nice. I am just who I am and I am wild and I'm crazy and I do amazing things both for your benefit and to your detriment. Just get with the program and stop trying to control the whole thing because you're only making it worse. Uh, Right. You know, I mean, this is what, this is how I read the Kali Yuga. You know, I think that's what we're in. We're in a, a time of global collapse. Uh, I don't think nature is going to die. I think nature will just kill us off and, you know, evolve in, in whatever way she evolves. But I think human civilization is uh, committing a kind of suicide. And I don't know if all humans will perish. I doubt that. But we will be drastically reduced in numbers so that we are no longer, um, I don't know if you know the term kudzu, but we're no longer the kudzu of, mm. of, the, the, uh, of, of nature. You know, a kudzu just takes over a tree and, and chokes it to death, basically, mm. starves it of oxygen. I mean, that's sort of what humans do. And we know that the weird thing about us is that we know we're doing it. And they go, yeah, that's terrible. We should stop doing it. And then we just keep doing it. So, I mean, that's one of the things I worry about with the, with the current use of the Sabbath, almost like, oh, I guess you might call it spiritual signaling, you know, like a virtue signaling. Mm. Oh, I keep a Sabbath. I don't go on Facebook one day a week. I don't tweet, you know, um, I mean, good for you. I, I don't even know. I, I deleted those apps because I don't want to, I don't want to do it on Tuesday either. Uh, but someone says, oh, I'm so spiritual. I, I make a Sabbath for myself. Mm. And, but it's privatized, mostly. Mm. You know, it's mm. just about me. And, and the point of it is simply to, to serve my own ends as opposed to free myself from the very notion of ends, mm. which is what I think the Shabbat is, is about. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to me that there is this acronym now about fear of missing out, that that has actually become a cultural phenomenon. Uh, And it connects, of course, to Sabbath and the reason so many people have trouble disconnecting uh, for for one, you know, one day a week. What do you say to that fear of missing out? And how do we work with that spiritually? Yeah, okay. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. But... uh... The fear of missing out, I think, masks the deeper fear of getting out in the sense of getting out of that box that tells you you could possibly be missing out. If if I think I'm a separate being, you know, Rami, uh, unconnected with the rest of the universe, then I've got to keep in touch. I've got to, I don't want to miss out on an experience personal experience, what my friends are doing, and, and all my friends are doing are lying. I mean, they're just on Facebook showing me the best thing that happened to them as opposed to, you know, the worst. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to keep in touch with all these faux things that they're sending me and that I'm sending out to them. If, if I think I'm this isolated being, then I'm desperate for connection. Yes. But if I realize who I actually am, which is the divine, the singular non-dual dynamic reality that we call God, Tao, Mother, Nature, whatever you want to call it. Uh, when I realize that's who I really am, I'm always connected. I can't miss out because there's nothing out, right? Mm-hmm. So, so if I can get out of the box, I realize I'm, I'm connected to everything. Right. Uh, and I think that is another reason to, to, or another hope that the Sabbath provides that at least you might glimpse for a couple of minutes during that day who you really are. And you're not who you think you are. You're just 
a, a happening of God. And again, that the name of God, the YHVH, Yod Hey Vav Hey, means happening. I mean, God is the happening. Happening is all happening. So I'm not all of God, but God is all of me and you and the chairs we're sitting on and, and everything else. So that that's what the Sabbath offers is that kind of opportunity for awakening. But you're not going to get it simply by unplugging your devices. Then you got to say, well, now what do I do? Mm. Right. So I mean, say, well, I'll read. OK, but then what are you going to read? Right. Is right. it going to is it going to. Uh, promote your sense of separateness what you're reading or is it going to help you see the greater reality of which you are a part um you know if you're reading the bible a lot of that is just xenophobic ethno-nationalist you know <laughs> craziness and that will just make you nuts mm. but maybe if you're reading um I don't know. My, my one of my favorite books is the Tao Te Ching. So if you're reading something like that on Saturday, that might help you realize that you know you're the Tao happening as as you, something like that. So there's you have to really make a concerted effort to spend the Sabbath not simply unplugging from the things that you know, think are harmful, but to realize the big plugging, <laughs> the big plug-in that you are, you know, that, that uh, you know, plugging back into the divine, tuning, what, what did Timothy Leary say? Tune in? No. What was his thing? Something, uh, turn drop, on, turn on, tune in, drop out. Right? Drop out. So turn on to your true nature as the divine, tune in to the fact that everything is the divine and drop out of the madness that tells you it's not. Right. So what you do on Shabbat is take LSD. I guess that's the answer. <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> Ayahuasca day. Ayahuasca, Ayahuasca day. Right? Ayahuasca. So what do you recommend besides not reading books that are separative? Or what do you recommend for somebody who is just approaching the idea of creating a Shabbat uh, for themselves? What are some of the parameters that you would you would suggest? Besides ayahuasca? Okay. Besides ayahuasca and LSD. <laughs> you know, I think, and I don't remember the Japanese for this, uh, but in English it's called forest bathing. When you, and not everyone can do this because not everyone has access to, to that kind of, I mean, I, I live near a forest, so I can go, uh, and, which is what I do every Saturday morning. It's about a mile from my house. I, I'm out of town. I'm in the woods by a, a river, a uh, small river, but a river. And I walk there. That's called, and you're just, you're just being bathed. You're not, it's not taking a bath in the woods. <laughs> it's being like when you say you're being bathed in light, right? So you're being bathed in the forest, uh, in, in the trees. And, and, you know, sometimes it's green in the spring and summer. Sometimes it's, you know, it's uh, fall and winter the trees are the leaves are gone but either way there's this tremendous sense of <sighs> you know when i'm walking in the forest it the, the movement of your body now of course this is limited to people who can do this who can walk and who have a place to walk it doesn't have to be the forest some people like mountains some people like rivers i live or uh you know ocean or something i happen to live near the forest and the japanese have a term called forest bathing so i'm using it but the rhythmic movement of walking itself, not uh, Thich Nhat Hanh mindfulness walking, though that that's okay. I mean, I'm not dissing that, but I just mean walking at your, whatever your normal pace is. Uh, just that movement causes you to breathe in a certain way. And in my experience, it just sort of triggers mantra chanting while I'm doing it. And I'm just walking through the forest feeling uh, embraced by and loved by and part of the environment, the entire environment. And in my case, uh, I'm lucky enough that there are uh, deer who live in the forest. So I, I don't, they don't come up to you. Thankfully, they're afraid enough from afraid of humans enough to stay safely away from us. But they're there. You can see them. They're eating. They're doing what they're doing by the river. And so you can feel you know, and I talk to them. I mean, I'm a little, little crazy, but I talk to, you know, uh, the deer, you know, sister deer, brother deer, whatever. And you feel this, you have, yeah, I guess you experience this communion with these other species. Shabbat could be a day for 
interspecies communion. And, and I don't know how, how odd this sounds, but I'm just going to take it one step further. In Judaism, there is this book called Perak Shira, which means chapters of song. And it's a mantra book for uh, revealing the mantra that uh, the animals use and the different kinds of trees and flowers use, they all have their own mantra. And this book tells you what they are. And luckily for us humans, all these beings speak Hebrew. <laughs> and, and they all, their mantra is always from, from a text of the Bible, usually the Psalms or something. And you can learn the mantra because it's in, it's in the book. It's an ancient book, but you know, I think it's written out there. And you can translate them into English. It just tells you Psalm, whatever it is. And then you can use that to, as, a, as a mantra to communicate with the deer, for example. I can't remember what the deer mantra is off the top of my head. But there, there's just techniques that different religions offer where you can commune with other species. Um, four-legged, I mean, we have a lot of turtles where I, where I walk, um, big tortoises and stuff. So, so there's, there's ways of, of doing that. Uh, I mean, that, that's how I spend my Sabbath. Uh, ultimately, I end up at a, a place in the river where you can actually walk out on these rocks and there's a tree and a big flat rock. It's almost as if it was designed for meditation and you can sit there cross-legged and the river goes around you and it mm. makes the rippling sound because there's lots of stones all around. And it's a great place to just sit and, and, and just be there. That's how I spend my, my Shabbat. Other ways to do it, I think it's about not just, it's unplugging from the artificial, if you can make that distinction, and plugging into the natural in whatever way you can, you can do that. One question I, I would have for myself is, is it private or is it communal? So I said, I talked about the privatization of Shabbat, meaning it's not just for me and everyone has to serve me, right? Because your, your servants are free and your animals are free and no one is there to serve you for a day. So it's communal. Everyone should be liberated on that day. On the other hand, it's private as in personal. I, I don't get the same benefit walking in the forest with others that I get walking alone. I, I like being alone. And if I can just add one more thing to it, referencing what you said about COVID earlier and, and sort of the animals coming back. Uh, I did my first in-person retreat last month at a um, gorgeous retreat center that I teach at about three times a year, at least I did before COVID, in uh, the Cumberland Plateau here in Tennessee. And there were deer everywhere because there hadn't been people there for 18 months. And the deer said, hey, those guys are gone. <laughs> it's safe. Let's go wander around where we used to wander around. And then when you walked into the woods and you went and they have a labyrinth there, it was you walking the labyrinth and the deer, you know, mm. were wandering around uh, around you. And that's another gift of COVID, you know, that the animals came back. I mean, that won't last <clears throat> uh, as we move back and, and do what, as we move back into post-COVID, if there is such a thing as post-COVID, and all we do is drag pre-COVID into post-COVID, then we've learned nothing and everything just stays the same. It was a, a hiatus, a horror for so many of us, and then we, we, we learn nothing. But if there's, if there's an opportunity to realize that, wait, all these animals are back, maybe if we just give them space, it'll be a, a, a better world for us. I mean, I'm being very Pollyanna-ish. I really think the environment, we, we've destroyed it. It's going to be too hot to live soon. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of hope for humanity, but, uh, or deer for that matter, it's going to get too hot for them too. Mm -hmm. But um, at least the Sabbath gives us an opportunity to, to turn things around if humans are capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. You've written a lot about the divine feminine and the need for reinjecting the feminine view into uh, the way we live. Aurobindo said, if we have a future at all, it's going to wear a crown of feminine design. Yeah. You know, how does that connect to this idea of shifting the way we live to create more space, to be less invasive, to, be, uh, to sort of get off that wheel of, of industry? 
Yeah, I think that that Aurobindo is right. Um, I think that one of the hallmarks of the era in which we live is the return of the Divine Mother mm -hmm. as a powerful, not just an archetype, but as a real felt force. Mm -hmm. um, if you, I mean, I, might, I know some of different traditions, but Judaism is my, my root tradition. And in Judaism, uh, the Divine Mother is called by many names, but, but Chachma is the first way she emerges. Uh, in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 8, verse 22, she starts talking to you directly. I mean, she's referenced all over the place. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, she says, hi, I'm the first thing. I'm, I'm the first manifesting of the divine. You know, Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching, I'm not going to get this perfectly, but uh, the unformed source is called Tao. The, the formed Tao is called mother. I think something like that. Um, in, in the Tao Te Ching. Uh, and, that, and that's what it is in the Hebrew Bible as well. The unformed happening or the formless happening takes form as Chachma Sophia wisdom. And, it, and, and, and her concern is with humanity and her concern is with human flourishing. And, you know, it's all these things that they talk about in there. But one of the things in this uh, book called The Wisdom of Solomon, second, I think it's second century BCE, though you never know exactly when these are written. But in The Wisdom of Solomon, which is not part of the Hebrew Bible, though it was a Hebrew book originally, it's in the Apocrypha of the Catholic Bible and uh, the Orthodox Christian Bibles, and I think the Anglican Episcopal Bible, that, where they have those intertestamental books between what they call the Old Testament and the New. Uh, the Wisdom of Solomon is there, and Solomon wrote the book. Not really, but that's the conceit. And Solomon says, this is what I've learned from wisdom. And he lists, in modern language, biology, psychology, cosmology, meteorology, um, uh, agri agriculture, whatever that, you know, whatever, whatever that is, you know, how to, how to um, you know, use the soil properly. Uh, the powers of vines and roots, you know, pharmacology. He goes through this whole list. And that's what the mother intended for us. Um, but we were so lost for so long in a patriarchal miasma of us against them and, and all of that. I mean, in, in the Hebrew Bible, God chooses the Jews. The mother doesn't choose anyone. The mother is for humanity as a whole. Right. And that's the, the ultimate shift from the, the, the dualistic us versus them mentality to uh, the non-dual, we're all in this together mentality from a zero-sum game of winners and losers to a non-zero game of everybody wins, everybody meaning not just people, but all living things. That to me is, is at the heart of the return of the Divine Mother at her most compassionate, maybe. But she has a flip side. I mean, oh. there's Kali with you know, the, the skulls and the, the severed head and the big tongue and all the blood. And that's her, her, you know, that's also mother. That's when mother says, okay, you don't want to listen. <laughs> then let me show you what you're gonna, what, what you're, you know, let me, let me show you what's going to happen. And as one of my teachers uh, said to me, you know, that uh, when I was first wrestling with my experiences with the divine mother, he said, she's going to strip you of everything, you know, everything you hold sacred until you're absolutely naked without any defenses and then she's going to show you the truth and that's what's happening to us now i think as a civilization or to some of us i mean it's happening to all of us some of us are going moving forward voluntarily some of us are kicking and screaming and and denying everything not just climate change and not just covid and vax anti-vaxxers and all of that but just denying the reality that it's one world one planet one humanity you know all of that um so what, what seems to be happening is that the teardown of, of the, the facade that we built about we're in charge, she's just destroying the whole thing. And, uh, you know, our, part of our response is the miracle of vaccinations and then the denial of you, you know, refusal to use them. I mean, that's, that's just typically human madness. And I don't think it's an accident that in the midst of COVID, we got privatization of outer space, you know, with, with the, you know, Elon Musk and uh, the, the Virgin 
uh, his name escapes me, but you know, yeah. I mean, those yeah. guys are going, okay, earth sucks. I'm out of here. Right. right. I mean, right. religion has been saying that for a long time that, okay, this planet is, is a, a launch pad for either another planet, if you're into the science end, or it's a launch pad for another life in a better place called heaven. Mm. And, uh, but, but what those two views have in common is earth sucks. I don't really care about it. Let it die. I'm blasting off either in a rocket or in spirit to the promised land, which is some other place entirely, uh, which is again, part of the, the human narcissism, spiritual narcissism, uh, all, you know, psychological narcissism, and our refusal to recognize that this is, that, you know, we're part of this, in, this incredible system, and there is no place to go. You can't escape it. I was watching the other day about a, a news segment about litter in outer space, that there's millions of bits of, of things zipping around. It's all trash that we've just dumped out there that's ripping holes in you know, the space station and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and, and we're not gonna clean it up. Just, it's, it's madness. That's why we're like kudzu. We're just strangling, not just the planet now, but near earth orbit. We're gonna just pollute that. And then we have to get farther out to avoid the, you know, that pollution and we'll just pollute more. I have, I am, I don't have a lot of hope for humanity. <laughs> I think we're, we're pretty screwed up. Uh, but the solution to being screwed up is to get unscrewed, which would be to, to realize your true nature, that this is all part of the divine happening. This is all the mother's unfolding. And if you listen to her teachings, whether you're listening to her in Sanskrit or Chinese or Hebrew or Greek uh, or Arabic, whatever your, you know, whatever languages, whatever tradition you're, you're, you're involved in, they all have the divine feminine aspect. And the divine feminine is always leading you to a place of um, world communion, you know, interspecies communion and or uh, devastation. I mean, it's going to be always a bit of both, but which one wins? I mean, it depends on which way we choose to go. Um, but without a Sabbath, without a Sabbath mindset, maybe, um, and I don't mean just unplugging for a day, but without a, a mindset that, a real, that helps us realize our true, our interconnectedness with all beings, um, I don't see a lot of hope for us. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love so much about your work is that it is uh, interfaith. It is inclusive. It is it is part of that feminine paradigm of inclusiveness. For you, uh, being for example, I know that you've studied Hinduism. I know you're familiar with Taoism, Buddhism. What is the value of a form like a tradition, for example, you know Judaism, when when the perennial philosophy is the bottom line? You know, is, is it, is it, would you recommend going directly in the sort of non-dual sense toward the divine or what is the value of the tradition in your, to your yeah, mind? I, I think it, the value is determined by the, the individual person. I, mm. you know, I mean, I, I was raised a Jew. Uh, it is my root tradition. Most of my training has been in that tradition. The primary language I use to explain the what I think is real is is Hebrew. Uh, I draw a lot from that that uh, the mystical side of Judaism. So it's in my head. I can't really escape it. I don't want to. Escape. It's too much work to try to say, okay, I'm not a Jew. I'm just going to be, you know, like uh, Rumi has. You know, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Christian. I'm not. You know, and yet he's still lives operates within you know a Sufi system. So mm -hmm. I, I think that some of us need to be grounded in one, in one system. Mm -hmm. But if we're buried in that system, as opposed mm -hmm. to being grounded in it, I think we're going to miss the bigger picture. Any system done properly, meaning, um, I mean, there's two ways to engage with a religion. One is the religion is, is the means and the end. I'm a Catholic, I'm going to become a better Catholic. I'm a Jew, I'm going to become a more observant Jew. Right. That's just circular, that's madness. But I'm a Catholic, I have all these Catholic things. Can they take me to the ground of being? You know, can they, can they lead me through Meister Eckhart? 
as opposed to uh, Pope Benedict. I mean, I don't know if that's really a good juxtaposition, but mm -hmm. and, um, Francis is good, Benedict bad, you know, that kind of <laughs> dualistic nonsense here. But can they lead me to St. Catherine? Can they lead me to Julian of Norwich? Can I work through Julian's Catholicism to realize the, the infinite divine in, with, and as everything? Then it's fine to work with a tradition. If you're in a tradition to stay in that box, I think it's deadly. I think it's it's not going to get you anywhere. You'll be a better Catholic, a better Jew, a better Hindu, but you won't be a better human being because you won't know the true nature of being human. I think that if you look at the mystic heart, and this is um, Brother Wayne Teasdale wrote that book, uh, The Mystic Heart, where he claimed that at the mystic heart of every religion, there is a core set of teachings. I think that's true. That to me is perennial wisdom. I define those core things. I mean, all the definitions are basically the same. I'm just not, I try to make it very simple. I mean, it's just four points. The one is everything is a manifesting of God, Brahman, Tao, mother, whatever you want to call it. Number two is you can know that directly through meditation, through music, through art, through, you know, walking in the forest, but you can have that awakening. Uh, number three, when you have the awakening, you can only engage with life uh, with love and justice and respect. You, you can't do evil. You can't have an other that you're going to exploit when you realize there's no other, there's just this and we're all this. And then the fourth point is awakening to that divine reality and acting lovingly from it is the highest, comprises the highest uh, purpose of the human being. I mean, that's why we're here. I think you can get to that through any religion. I was lucky enough, I don't know if, you, if you'll bear with me for a second. In 1984, Father Thomas Keating mm. convened what uh, ended up being called the Snow Mass Group. And I was invited in the beginning. It lasted 35 years. I came in and out. But I was there for the first few years. And the idea was to bring together a dozen mystics from 12 different traditions. And we would live together in his monastery in Snowmass, Colorado, and meditate and dialogue together. Each person was invited to follow her own path, right? So uh, Bernie Glassman was there in the beginning, the Zen Buddhist master, and he sat Zazen, and I was there and I did my thing. And uh, Douglas Steer, who's at the time was like the sort of the, the great grandfather of Quaker um, religion. And he did his, his Quaker thing, whatever that was. So everyone was doing uh, his or her own thing. And then afterwards, we would talk about our experiences with contemplative practice. And Father Thomas said, the only rule was you can't speak for your tradition. So I couldn't say, oh, we Jews believe whatever. I could say my experience is, and I'm naturally going to use Jewish language to frame it. When we started working within that boundary, it was clear that we are all having the same experience, even though we were articulating it in different ways. But the, we were, the experience itself was ineffable. And then when we tried to talk about it, we all went back to our, I mean, it's easier for me to use Hebrew and Jewish terminology than it is to use Sanskrit and, and Buddhist terminology, though I know the terms. It's just not my natural style. So as everyone shared, we went, wait, we're all having the same experience. Now that may not be a revelation to anyone, you know, listening or watching this, but in, in, in 84, even though I'd been studying world religions for a long time, it was an intellectual study. And here I was sitting with people who were saying, this is what I experienced. And ultimately there is no experience because the I is gone, right? But be that as it may, here's what I experience or think I experienced when the I came back. And it was clear that it's all the same. So there are some people, uh, Krishnamurti, I would say, maybe someone like Krishnamurti. I was going to say Ramana Maharshi, though he did have a soft spot for Hinduism, the Sargadatta Maharaj. There, there are individuals who can just cut to the core and they're, they go right to the perennial wisdom and they don't need the trappings or the uh, traditions of any other system. Either way, I mean, if that works for you, that, then do that. But I, I, I work with 
the Jewish uh, trappings. Uh, the way the way Reb Zalman Shachter Shalomi, my my Rebbe, put it, he said that uh, he called me a Jewish practitioner of perennial wisdom, mm-hmm. and that's that's what what that's that's what defines me, I guess. But some people can say, no, I don't need the adjective. I'm just a practitioner of perennial wisdom. Mm. When you look into the future in your crystal ball, uh, do you see religion and traditions uh, continuing as they have, or do you feel like it's going to move just toward a non-dual perennial core that becomes the, the sort of world path? Is that something that you could imagine happening? I could imagine desiring it to happen. <laughs> I don't know if I could imagine it happening. I, I think people are, I think the answer is no, that it's going to be the worst case scenario. It's just going to be more of what it is with all these religions devolving into ethno-nationalist theocracies. I mean, that's what's happening in, in Israel and vicariously in, in a lot of Judaisms outside of Israel. You know, Hinduism in India is all about ethno-nationalism. Yes. Uh, you see that in, in Islamic states. Um, I mean, even, even Buddhist countries where you'd like to think, no, they wouldn't do that. No, I mean, look at Myanmar. So yes, yes. It, it's, it's everywhere. Religion is devolving and dragging its parishioners with them, with it, you know, right? And, and that, that's one thing happening. But there are a lot of people who go, well, this is not what I signed up for. You know, it's, it's, and, and they're going to hopefully take the religions in a different way. So you'll have at least two tracks, one just devolving into more and more violent, xenophobic, um, ethno-nationalist theocratic systems. And then you'll have another track that's trying to take the, the perennial road or the mystical road and, and lift uh, whatever their tradition is, whatever the person's tradition is, out of that ethno-nationalism. And then there's going to be a small group of mystics mm-hmm. who will maybe start in that direction toward the perennial and then fall into the perennial and say, okay, wait a minute. It's not enough to just use one language to speak about the the truth with a capital T, that I need to, it's just talking about it in terms of, of Hebrew alone isn't enough. I need to be bilingual, trilingual. I need to be able to use a lot of different languages. Even if my root language is uh, Jewish, I need to be able to speak Christian, speak Taoist, speak Buddhist, not so I can talk to Buddhists, but so that Buddhists can talk to me, so that Buddhism can speak to me, because ultimately, the Buddha was just another human like me. Ultimately, the Buddha is just a manifestation of the divine mother or the, the yudhe vavhe, however you want to look at it, just like me. Uh, if I want to learn to commune with the deer, I need to know the mantra of the deer. If I want to communicate uh, deeply with, with the Buddhist, I need to know the language of the Buddhist. And that will change everything because the more languages we speak, the more subtle, I guess, more sensitive our understanding of this, the of reality. I won't even say spiritual, but because the more sensitive, the more sensitive we are to reality itself, because different languages have different ways of articulating things that will show up. They'll reveal nuances that I didn't get from the Hebrew. Uh, so, so the more we can learn from, from one another in that regard, but that's not interfaith. Because interfaith is, we Jews believe this. Next, we Catholics believe this. We Hindus believe this. And the only thing we have in common is, at least while we're sitting on the interfaith panel, we're not going to kill each other. That's but not what you're talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what Father Thomas did with the Snowmass group, where mm. we all go deep together each in our own way, but then realize the commonality of our experience in, in with and as the divine. <clears throat> and then our ability to share the language that helps us see that more, experience that more deeply. I, I, again, I'm, I never know how clear I am in these things, but hopefully that, that makes some sense. Mm-hmm. That's, that, if I have hope, that's my hope. That's what's going to happen. But it's going to happen among a small number of people. Mm. It's not a mass movement. 
religion isn't going to evolve into something better. Uh, but there will be, let, let me just say one other thing. What I'm, what I'm not saying is someone who's just generically spiritual, right? And has no depth whatsoever. I'm just spiritual, I'm not religious. A lot of people who say that are just on the surface. They're just into um, the most, and obviously this is very critical, so I'm not talking about you, whoever's listening. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm talking about someone else who just has no depth to their spirituality, because ultimately the depth is the erasure of your separate self. And most people who say I'm spiritual, but not religious are, are still operating on, a, on from the egoic level. And that's not spiritual. Spiritual is taking you to something much greater. Uh, so I'm not talking about that kind of person, that's maybe a fourth development. Now I'm talking about mystics who are, for whatever reason, driven to experience, have a direct experience of the ineffable reality in, you know, I love St. Paul, in which we live and move and have our being. Mm. Uh, those individuals are the hope, you know, and, and they don't, you don't have to have a lot of them. You just mm. have to have enough of them and I don't know what that number is. I mean, in Judaism, the number is 36, but, you know, that's okay. But you have to have enough of them to, to make, um, to reach a tipping point mm -hmm. that will move humanity in, in the direction of compassion, love, and justice, and not the devolution of, of into cruelty and, and passion rather than compassion and, and injustice, passing for justice. Mm. So big picture, you don't have a lot of hope for <laughs> humanity, but there is a chance that if the minority show up in this kind of way, that something human yeah. can survive. Yeah, yeah. All right, right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not hopeful because I, I know enough history to think, you know, but the arc of justice is, doesn't seem to be bending in the right direction. So, you know, I look at, I look at, uh, climate change mm. and we've got there's not we've already crossed the rubicon yeah. so what what are we going to do with millions and millions of climate refugees mm -hmm. we're not going to embrace them and give them the scarce water that's left and the scarce we are going to build walls and we're going to let them die and some of us are going to cry about it but uh, others will get we have to do it that's the only way we're going to survive Right. That's sort of how, I mean, just look at the way we treat uh, people who are, are seeking refuge just coming up from, from South America. Yeah, yeah. And look at the way we had to be dragged and we're still not doing it, kicking and screaming to help the Afghans who helped us for 20 years. We don't really want them. So just imagine you know, multiplying that so that there's millions and millions of people coming and it won't be, they won't, they're not coming to Texas. They're going to go through Texas. They want to get to Minnesota. They want to get to Duluth, where right. there'll be some water and right. some temperatures that are, that are survivable, not, not the Southwest, not California, which will just be you know, a raging inferno for, for maybe centuries, who knows? I mean, we're not prepared, humans are not prepared for the madness that's coming. And that's why, to bring it back full circle, that's why you need Shabbat. You've mm. got to begin to compare, to prepare. Can you even just a little one day a week commune with your true self and therefore the planet, the cosmos? Can you recognize the, the interdependence of all those things? Can you fall in love with life in all its forms mm. one day a week? Mm. And then maybe that'll help us you know, uh, when, when it gets more and more bleak. That's the hope of, of spirituality. The, these mystics, we all don't have to become mystics, but if the mystics can get into the zeitgeist, the, the mindset, the worldview of humanity deeply enough to cause a little bit of shift so that we don't see these people coming across the border because they have no, because their homes are on fire, right? I mean, it's, it's probably going to happen <coughs> when the people of Oregon, you know, try to move, you know, east. And you go, we don't, 
we don't want those people. <laughs> right? Wait, you guys are in Oregon, burn in Oregon. We're going to build a wall and we're going to keep you out because we don't want you here in uh, New Jersey or, you know, make it up a place. <laughs> Just pick, pick on a state. We can't even handle that for our fellow Americans, let alone our fellow humans from other places. So if we can reach a tipping point where, where we could shift that to some extent, and then there's hope for many of us, though not all of us. Well, I, people like you who are doing this kind of work are real beacons of hope. For the no, no, I'm building a bunker. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's really good to talk to you. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. And this is, this is really informative for me. Well, thanks, Mark. I hope it wasn't too much of a downer. <laughs> Not at all. No, it's, it's refreshing to see somebody who has both views, who has the mystic view, but all, who also isn't, you know, Pollyanna and whitewashing what's, what's really going on. Yeah. That's well, what we need. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure to see you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.